This Talking Flutes podcast is kindly sponsored by Trevor James Flutes, making life sound beautiful. You can show them some flute love by following them on Instagram at TJ Flutes, Trevor James Flutes on Facebook, and at trevorjamesflutes.com. Hello, this is Talking Flutes and I'm Claire Southwest. Now today, I'm going to continue my lovely discussion with Patricia Nagel in Paris, because in our last chat, we spoke a lot about her early career and how she became an American in Paris and her teaching at uh, the Ecole Normale and, and how you can audition and get in and how her courses go there. But we didn't touch on her performances and her work with contemporary music and contemporary flutes. So hello again, Patricia. Hello, Claire. Nice to, nice to talk to you and again. It was so nice to chat. Yeah, it's good to chat, isn't it? I mean, that's what this whole thing is about. It's, it's lovely for people to get, uh, get to know you a little bit and to get to, to know about you and what you do and, you know, how you work. Now, we didn't talk about flutes. Now, you are, you're a champion of, of contemporary works and I know you have a, a Kingma flute. I think you also have a, a bass flute as well. Kingma system flute and a bass flute? Yes, yes, right? yes. Do you swap between Boehm and the Kingma system or do you just play on the Kingma system now? Well, I play on a Boehm flute, uh, the C flute, even yeah. though my colleague, she has a Kingma Brannan, which is great. In, fa in fact, I found it for her at the Brannan shop. Um, she was in the mountains on vacation and she was very interested in buying a king mat, you know, a flute uh, on, on ut, you know, the normal flute that we play in the orchestra. And there was this flute there they were selling. And I said, just listen to this great sound. It's fantastic. And it's true. Uh, the king mat system on the Brannan makes the sound a little bit larger and more depth. And it was a, a great flute. So uh, she kind of like bought it on the phone. <laughs> I'll reserve that in any, any case. But um, I play on a uh, alto, alto flute king resistant. Yes. And um, that is a phenomenal flute, and it's great for playing in tune as well as uh, or playing multiphonics or what do you call it? Uh, Quadratone, should say in English. Yes. So um, it's it's quite phenomenal and it's it's really has a great sound. I mean, you can play it as a normal flute. You can play the solo in Stravinsky on it in the orchestra or the solo in uh, Daphne C. Chloe, just as a normal flute. You yeah. don't have to worry. It's an open hold flute, flute yeah. alto flute. Alto flute, um, open hold. Yeah. Quarter tone. Quarter tone. All the quarter tones. Yes. I, so I it means I'd love, you to, I'd love you to to tell the listeners exactly what a kingma system is. Ah, there was something she invented, this wonderful Dutch luthier. In fact, in fact um, I've done articles with her or on her, on her work. And she developed a system where there would be key on key. So when you look at your thumb, you have four keys because you have a little higher than the the B pitch a little bit lower, and then you have a special key when you're going to do B flat, and it, it, it makes a lot of differences. And you have, uh, on each key, you have two keys in a way. And the F sharp quarter tone key is absolutely fantastic because it's part of the rod where you put, it, of course the F sharp of course is on your fourth finger down there, but it's a little rod that you, if you hit it, it's where you, your index, your right hand index, if you hit it accidentally, all of a sudden it opens up a hole and you're in big trouble. But <laughs> it's, so it means that the, the flute is a little bit heavy. It's a little bit heavier. Mm. And, um, but it's very ergonomic, the way that you put the keys uh, in the position. And we like this instrument so much that we ordered um, a bass flute, a kingma bass flute. And I say we, because I have a very good colleague, the one who bought the, the brand and Kingma. And we had, she had been also a professor at Le Colonel at one time. And we had the same 
um, concept of the sound. We have the same concept. And we're very careful with instruments. We, so we bought those instruments together. Why? Because it's very expensive. I mean, it's for, for a King Ma system now, it's very, very, it's even more. But at the time it was 10,000 euros and the bass flute was 10,000 euros. And since I don't use it every day, but I, I, when I do use it, I'm so happy to have such a good instrument. So we share, we, we really share these instruments. And I really um, inspire anybody who has good friends, even to buy something, uh, three people, uh, like an octo bass, because you don't use it that much, unless you're using it all the time in a contemporary music uh, situation. Uh, so I have a bass flute, which is what, which is incredibly sonorous, the bass flute, because it has a wide bore. And so when I'm in, I was playing in the uh, Résonance 21. It's, it's a new contemporary flute orchestra here in Paris. I was rehearsing yesterday, but when I played the bass, I was playing a bass flute on a few things. I think that the other bass flutes, they sound like, I don't know, you can't even hear them. <laughs> it was very funny. So Eva Kingma, she really developed a, you know, a great concept. I'm very proud of her. She, she, she's a wonderful person and a great uh, flute maker. Yeah. Did it take you long to learn how to play it? No, you can pick it up. Anybody can pick it up and play it right away. You just have to be careful for that uh, quarter tone F sharp. That's yeah. all. If you have a bad position with your right hand. But um, no, 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 you can play it right away. And then you learn a lot of things and you can play quarter tone uh, not chromatic scales, but quarter tone scales. Yes. Um, it, it brings you to a little bit, um, a different type of um, concept in your, you know, performing. I remember playing um, oh, what, what, a play, piece by Robert Dick Blues. It was so, so funny. It, this, I was playing on the quarter tone flute. It's really, really incredible. The, the things that you can do, especially if you're in the orchestra, and sometimes orchestra playing is very difficult for intonation. Yes. You know? Yeah. So if you have a quarter tone flute, you can absolutely play in tune with everybody, which is quite amazing. <laughs> do you have a, a, a C flute kingma system? No, I do not. I do not. I, I'd rather have just a normal flute. At the time I had, I don't, I think I had a Sheridan gold flute which yeah. is phenomenal yes. i was very lucky to have uh, such a great flute he's a great ETA. then um i had a nagahara also wonderful <laughs> yeah what well, kanichi is uh, just a great man he's so talented and uh, because I'll, I'll tell you why why ch i changed because it's it's interesting i i know a lot about flutes i've had many different flutes and now i'm playing on a Manker platinum head joint. Yes. With a, okay, with a uh, 18 carat, you know, with a platinum rise, I think, but on a Brannon gold flute, which uh -huh. is quite new to me, yeah. which is, uh, uh, so no, it was, it's not new because I really started, but well, I started off with a very, um, um, a $300 <laughs> Haynes flute at the time you know, covered hall, it was probably industrial model, then the Haynes open hall, and then uh, other Haynes, and then other Powell's, because I was from Boston. And when you're from Boston, you have Haynes and Powell at your, you know, fingertips. So, and, and they're very good flutes. Then Brannan became popular. Brannan started their own business because the Brannan people are from Powell, originally from Haynes, of course, you know. And um, I had a few Brannan flutes, they're great flutes. They're, they're the Rolls Royce of flutes. And um, I think what happens when you develop and you're playing different music in your career, you're always, well, at least me, I'm always looking for something a little bit better, a little bit better sound, a little bit more color, a little bit this and that. And I'm very curious about the luthier, the, the way things are made. So I can't, I ran into this, I ran into this type of, you know, playing. And uh, you, you really change your concept. And sometimes you go in the wrong direction and you come back. Okay, which is a very expensive problem. <laughs> <laughs> because flutes are, nowadays are so expensive. But uh, you can find a fantastic instrument, not too expensive, 
but they're rare. Sometimes you, I picked up a flute the other day. It happened to be a burkhat and it was a gold on the outside, silver on the inside, but it was so vibrant. Mm. It was just amazing. That type of flute that just sings and is vibrant is the most beautiful color. And I regret it because it was a little bit too easy for me. Mm. You know, sometimes we have a way of playing that it's, you know, so, um, and then some a great flute is from the a student from the Paris Conservatory got that flute, but there are a lot of great flutes out there. They don't have to necessarily be expensive, no, but no, some no. are made better than others. Yeah, uh, it's always good to try. I always used to say, you know, you you when you find a flute that you don't want to put down because you love ah. it, if there's something in yes. the sound that connects with you, then that's that becomes your flute, and it doesn't matter if it's a a nickel silver or platinum if it works for you and you can create your music then that's fantastic that's absolutely true and really what, what what we really must say is that uh when you come out on stage or when you start playing for a rehearsal whatever the most important part of music is that first initial sound mm -hmm. and that is the beginning of all music and when you come out and you play that sound, everybody in the whole whole hall listens to you because there's something magic about it. And, and I think that's probably what we're all, you know, looking for, that, that special thing. And when you find it, you must keep it. Absolutely. When you find it, you have got to keep it. Uh, <laughs> you remind me of um, when I was a student and um, we, were, we were in class all playing something and and... William Bennett was selling a flute. I, I wasn't intending to buy it because first of all, it was open G sharp and I played closed G sharp. Oh, but wow. <laughs> I, just, I just picked it up to play in this class and everyone stopped because out came the most incredible sounds out of this flute. And I just wow. went, oh, wow, I need to buy this flute. It was incredible. And so I changed to open G sharp just on the basis of that, the sound. But how could you do that? I don't know. I just don't know. Something just clicked. And I think that's the same with us, us all. Sometimes it just, something clicks with you and it, and it works and you can't let it go. And how long did it take you to master an you know, open G sharp? Well, that's an interesting one because I do remember the next day I was playing in a class playing the Schubert Introduction of Variations. And oh, I, wow. I, I played it. But a year later, playing Prokofiev Sonata, I got confused with the fingering for the third octave, the top Ds, just out of the blue. So it's, I think it's because I always used to teach with people with closed G sharp, that if I'd been yes. teaching a lot, it, my fingers automatically went to the original system. Um, That's so true. Kind of, just get back to thinking again, but but I I, I love the open G sharp system. I think it, it works it works really well, and in fact, yes, Trevor James flutes are, are now producing an open G sharp beginner flute, which mm. is which is very interesting. Um, original, you might change the world. Who this knows? Might change the world. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, let's get back to your to your flutes. Now, you've done a lot for contemporary music. Tell, tell us some of the things that you, you've done in terms of pieces you've, have you commissioned or you've found funding for them? Yes, yes. Well, some composers have written them for me. Yeah. I've tried to commission them, but I didn't really know where to, to find the, the, the money at the time. But um, I've, I've had uh, pieces dedicated to me. And um, let's see, I've played a lot of um, music for the first time, which is called a primaire some that are not commissioned, you know, or dedicated to me. But um, I've had pieces by Anthony Gerard. He wrote me a concertino. And um, just recently, uh, Christophe Caliendo, he dedicated the 14th uh, Siciliana Sonata to me. Have you performed uh, it yet? No, not yet. I'm looking for a premiere. Okay. I have to find a place where I can premiere it. Maybe at the NFA, but I was thinking maybe more in Sicily or in Italy because of the piece. Uh, but getting back to contemporary music, I have played things by uh, Pole, and I have played, um, hola, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, 
Nazis Bonnet, contemporary music. I have played um, French composers. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of them all, but I've played enormously, an, an enormous amount of, um, even uh, Gary Shocker, he wrote some pieces, new pieces for me. Um, but getting back to the contemporary modes of playing, where, where you have, I, I played uh, pieces by Michel Merlet, which are very, very difficult, where you have all sorts of um, jeux de mode, which means like tongue ram, multiphonics, um, everything. Uh, and it's, it's really a lot of fun. And um, what, what can I say? It's always very exciting to do that, especially the first time people are very interested in that. Mm. It's very inspiring. Absolutely. Very, very and often very difficult. Yes, very difficult. Uh, I, I, like we, we, we would have great composers come, like Philippe Ersson to the conservatory and would play uh, things by, by him. That were, you know, he's a great French composer. Thierry Esquèche. Um, you know, maybe I don't know if you know them in England, but we, we don't know them so well. But it's it's nice to hear hear their names. But you do you do so much uh, in terms of of introducing people to living composers, which is oh, so important. So important, absolutely, so important. Tell us about your chamber music. Well, chamber music, I've played a lot of in different different groups, but I played um, mostly flute and harp, or flute and piano, do playing pieces that nobody knows about, uh, Casa de Su, Sonata, which is, is, is published, but nobody ever plays it, or playing pieces where people um, even don't know, but really good works. And I played with flute and guitar a lot, and then of course flute, harp, and uh, alto, and... Yeah. Flute, piano, and saxophone, and flute, piano, and cello, <laughs> you know, the usual. And of course, quintets, and sextets, and quartets. <laughs> Everybody does that, does that, and they know all the repertoire, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very exciting. So it's lovely because you've got such a, um, a, a lovely um, uh, mix, a lovely, healthy sort of mix of, of professional work between all your different types of performances and your, your teaching. And, and also I know you do some writing as well. So um, mm. you very much remind me of the, of the things I used to do. This, uh, uh, I didn't stick to one, oh, wow. I like to do different things. And it, it's, it's really very refreshing to hear that you do uh, a lot of the mm. same things. Well, one of, one of the th things that just came out was great. It's, it was the, the Valsa Bravel. La Valse, yes. and we transcribed, I transcribed it with somebody who did everything on the computer because I don't have that technique of Sibelius or whatever, yeah. or final. But we did uh, two flutes and piano. Yeah. And uh, the two flutes are interchanging between piccolo, alto flute, flute bass, and we're going back and forth for all the colors uh, because it, there's a lot of color in the Valse de Ravel. Uh -huh. And what really inspired me is that um, there was one, Ginette Keller, a uh, composer, um, and she was also professor at L'École uh, Normale and uh, Conservatoire de Paris. She uh, transcribed Ma Mère Loire, Mother Goose Feet, where, uh, you know, you know, with the, with the, the belly la bête, you have the bass flute playing, you know, the, the contrabassoon part and everything, with piccolos and everything. It was great, great. She was a great orchestrator. Then she did La Valse um, Noble et Sentimentale, and then, of course, she, well, she, she, she passed away, and, you know, she was so sadly missed. So I had this idea of doing the um, La Valse de Ravel, which I love this piece, you know, with the orchestra. Mm -hmm. So we did that just recently with Pascal Roger, who's a very famous pianist. Mm -hmm. He's world famous. He got the most important Tchaikovsky Prize, I think, mm -hmm. or one of the best prizes. Oh, no, uh, Marguerite Long. Okay. Uh, yes. When he was very young. And yeah. he always used to come on tour with us and he would play the concertos, uh, you know, either Ravel en sol or with the left hand Ravel or he'd play. And we, I'd just be in the orchestra mm -hmm. playing with him. And he was a young guy. And then, of course, now he is my colleague at L'Ecole Normale. He just came. And so we said, would you accept to play this with us? And he did. Wonderful. And we did it for the NFA. So 
So I, I put it online from time to time. I'm very proud of it because with my colleague, Mihi Kim, um, who's Korean, but very French, of course, yes. we played this together and she, it was what, really a great, uh, great performance. Now, can, can our listeners hear this? Is it, do you have it, are you on YouTube or? It's on YouTube, just it's on put, YouTube. I love us to have them. Um, uh, Patricia Nagel, Mihi Kim, or Pascal Roger. And it's, it's a, uh, an arrangement. It's very funny because we're changing instruments all the time. Yeah. You know, but when you have the iPad and the pedal and you're changing the instrument, you know, you speak, is it piccolo now? Then you have to turn the page. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. It's, it's, it's like be, being very sportive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very complex. Now, will all these pieces you've mentioned, all these sort of uh, transcriptions, are they, are they published? No. I, in fact, I should publish them as soon as possible. There are many different editors that want to do it, but I was waiting uh, for Revel. It was still underneath uh, the public domain. Yes. And now, it's, now we can publish it. Yeah. Since last year, or maybe you, since two years, I've just been very lazy. Now, I really should do it because a lot of Plutus would love to play those pieces. Yes. They're so much fun. Oh, well, we, we certainly look forward to that. Now, <laughs> we've, um, of course, all of us have come through this terrible sort of almost two years now of not being able to sort of, travel and and with covid and and restrictions on everything have you managed to make plans for this next year now that restrictions are being lifted uh, well now it's kind of like an opening and a new beginning yes. we're being reborn again and we're thinking differently because we had a lot of time to think of what we did before uh how, how we maybe abuse the planet by traveling too much or doing this and that taking everything for granted Oh, everything sort of it's up in the air in a way I think for everybody mm. we're, we're going maybe soul searching and what my uh, next uh, project is you know recording with the guitarist we have a plan to to do some you know music and I would like to record some things that I was was not able to record before and uh, of course uh, perform mm -hmm. perform and do uh, my next transcription don't laugh is going to be uh, l'enfant et sortilège of Ravel. For but so I mean, the little little projects like that that Lovely. keep us going. And my students are absolutely fantastic. I am so enthusiastic. They're doing so well. There's so much to do out there. There's the Concours International, and this is so great when you can um, share and you can inspire people and you can give them courage and motivation and confidence. To go to really go ahead because this is the you know the younger generation coming up, and it's so important to form that and, and to help them, and to help them grow into um, really great musicians and and wonderful musicians and colleagues between themselves, which I see, yeah. I see you know it's it, it, it at one time in America in the United States people were very jealous they're very you know very strange. And what I find here in Europe, that people are very, um, they're helping each other they do. all the time. Yes. And yes. there's no jealousy, well, because it's a little healthy jealousy maybe, but that helps us to become a little bit better. And, and mm. of course, one of the big changes since COVID is, of course, doing things that we're doing on Zoom. Because if it hadn't been for COVID, I would never be talking to you now. Because I hadn't exactly Zoom. And I've spoken right. to so many people and and from all over the world and it's been a revelation we're and coming more together yes and everybody have you done some teaching with zoom have you have you managed to do things in person yes 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 i have no i i've been teaching a lot in person during covid because the school allowed it we had big rooms okay. we could but i did a lot of uh, master classes yes in, you know in the united states at least two um I can't, I can't remember now because there's so, so many different things. Yes. And also I was giving classes. Some of my students stayed in China because they wanted to stay at home. Yes. And, you know, giving lessons online is not always very easy because of the sound. Exactly. Yes. Coming yes. through the computer and, and you know. So um, it was, we're, we're all a little bit just coming out. And I don't think we've really gotten back to normal yet. Not quite, no. No, um, no but it, not it's yet. Feeling, it's feeling a little better, though, and, and certainly we're having now one-to-one -one lessons at the conservatoires and concerts are starting again, but I think the music industry has taken a big, big hit 
but they haven't been as well supported certainly here in the UK um, yes it's so um, sad yes a lot of a lot of my colleagues have have almost given up because they 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 weren't able to sort of earn any money with their music that is so sad that is so sad I think it comes from Anglo-Saxon countries like United States, so remember the Metropolitan yes. uh, Opera in New York, nobody yes. was you know, paid. But in France, they were very humanistic. I mean, they were fantastic. Everybody got their salary at the opera, the, all the orchestras and all the professors. They, they, of course, they could teach as well, but not always. Yes. And I think that was a great support to help people. Mm. Yeah. It's so sad when that happens. It's outraging. It's, it's, it makes me it makes me really very very upset because if we don't have culture if we don't have the arts we don't have anything no no absolutely but you know you've I've been I've been watching what you've been doing recently and you've been doing a lot to uh, you know there's been a lot of music making and a lot of, of, of things happening which is which is absolutely wonderful your students are very lucky to have you uh, oh thank so you. The, I'm lucky to have them. <laughs> yes, uh, well, it goes both ways, doesn't it? Um, mm, yes, it does. Yes. So, so Patricia, it's been it's been absolute an absolute joy to talk to you. It's fascinating. You've had such a fascinating career. Um, it's absolute. Come absolute here as well to talk to you. And and I would like to say to all our listeners, go on YouTube and put in Patricia Nagel flute and go and listen to the the wonderful flute playing. And um, you will not be disappointed. It's absolutely wonderful. So I wish you all the best for the for the coming year. Thank you, thank you, Claire. And I hope that uh, we will see each other soon. I hope so. I hope you come to Paris, or, or maybe I'll come to London, and we can. I don't know if you're in London exactly, but I hope that we will see each other soon. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And I, yes, and I really want to say how much I adored your concours. <laughs> when you played, you played so magnificently at the, uh, you know, in, the, in America and you won first prize and everybody was astonished by your talent and your beautiful playing. Oh, Bravo thank to you. you. Thank you, Patricia. And I wish you all the best. And next time we'll see each other in person. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Bye bye. Goodbye for now, Claire. Thank you very much for having me. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.